Hello cousins near and far, and welcome to my channel Ancestral Spotlight. If you would be so kind as to subscribe to my channel, I would be very grateful for the support. Today I'd like to shine the spotlight on a Native American that most of us have never heard of, Chief Donahue. It's said that there are no documented accounts of a chief with that name. It's said that he likely didn't exist. And when saying his name a few times over, one can't ignore the potential irony with a play on words, Chief Donahue, Chief Donahue, Chief Don't Know Who. Maybe that was the case. But if I've learned anything during my years of researching, it's that myths and legends generally stem from a truth or need, no matter how small. To that end, let me share with you something that wasn't a small matter. After the removal of the Cherokee, which most of you are probably familiar with the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the government issued money to the Cherokee people. They had to fill out an application and show a bit of their genealogy connecting them to the Cherokee tribe. Then these applications had to be approved by the government for these people to become official members of the tribe they're claiming descent. In a very specific case, between 800 and 1,000 individual applications, representing approximately 1,500 people, were rejected. Reportedly, each of these applications showed a similar genealogy back to Chief Donahue. Problem was, and continues to be, they cannot find evidence of his existence anywhere. Let's have a look at the head of the genealogy laid out across nearly 1,000 separate genealogies on the applications of people that likely did not know each other. I mean, can you personally name 1,000 cousins you talk to regularly? You have Chief Donahue at the top, born circa 1700 near the James River in Virginia. He married a white woman by the name of Mary Wentworth. Together, they had a daughter named Elizabeth Donahue, who also went by the very common nickname for Elizabeth, Betty. Elizabeth Betty Donahue married William Bill Pledge. So this Betty Donahue and William Pledge had at least two children together. A daughter also named Elizabeth, which was a very common naming tradition, and a son named Frank. Now Betty Donahue, aside from her two children with husband William Pledge, had at least two other children outside of her marriage to William, likely within a marriage, either prior to or after her marriage to William. These children are John Ayers and Yona Jessica, often recorded as Yona Luska, and Yonalaski. I'm going to point out three important things here. Firstly, the special commissioner overseeing the enrollment of the Eastern Cherokee in his report said, speaking of all the Chief Donahue descendant applications that were rejected, quote, it appears from the testimony that the family had an ancestor of Indian extraction from a Virginia tribe at some time before the Revolutionary War." End quote. For those that need a refresher, the Revolutionary War took place from 1775 to 1783. So we're looking into a time period prior to 1775 in Virginia. Secondly, we're talking about the Eastern Band of Cherokees, not the Western. The Cherokee people were broken in half during the removal. Those that completed the journey to Oklahoma are the Western Cherokee, and those that remained are the Eastern Band. Lastly, there are two Elizabeths. Elizabeth Donahue, who married William Pledge, and their daughter, Elizabeth Pledge. Now, just as Elizabeth Donahue had two sons from another relationship, it is entirely possible that William Pledge had a second wife, who would be Anne Redford. Now, let's have a quick review. 
At some point while walking the Trail of Tears, and perhaps running off into the hills to remain in their ancestral lands, fleeing from soldiers, mothers smothering their own crying infants to keep their other children from being found, and while finding the strength in the aftermath to continue on as a Native American in a white-dominated world, nearly 1,000 people that probably didn't know each other somehow managed to get together and dream up a similar genealogy to a person that didn't exist? Okay. But that wasn't the only reason these applications were rejected. These applications are referencing the Eastern Band of Cherokees versus the United States in the Court of Claims. Part of the reason for rejection was because none of their family had enrolled as part of the Cherokee Nation in either 1835 or 1851. The question now becomes, if they were Cherokee, why didn't they enroll at previous junctures in time that would have made them members of the tribe? Well, the answer is pretty clear. We know that the people that make up the Eastern Band of Cherokees had escaped the Trail of Tears and sought shelter in the mountains of their homeland, these ranging from North Carolina to Virginia. Some whites sympathized with the natives and allowed them to live on their privately owned lands. Any Cherokees living on private lands were not subject to removal. And so, now we turn to a man named Yonajaska. This is none other than the proclaimed son of Elizabeth Betty Donahue, spelled Jonalaska. Same place, same time frame, and probably her eldest son, but that would be speculation. He lived from 1759 to 1839. He was the only chief who remained in the hills to rebuild the eastern band of the Cherokees. The events of his life are well documented. The Cherokee had a matrilineal system of inheritance. Therefore, he was of the same tribe as his mother, Cherokee, which tells us that Elizabeth Betty Donahue was of the Eastern Cherokee. The position of the mother also sometimes dictates the status of the children. Janaleska was a leader of the people, and so one might assume his mother was of high status, perhaps the daughter of a chief. Yonaluska and his wife adopted a white son named William Holland Thomas. William had an Indian name. He spoke the language and knew the customs. He was a part of the tribe. The Cherokee, since they were not citizens, were unable to purchase land. So prior to the removal, William Thomas, adopted son of Yonaluska, purchased land along the Okana Lufti River in the Great Smoky Mountains. And it is here that Yonajuska led over 400 Cherokees, where they were not subject to removal. Yonaluska was joined here by several other small bands of Indians, and they were safe for a time while on this land. This area is known as Snowbird, and these people now referred to as the Snowbird Cherokees. Shifting gears for a moment, I want to address something stated as fact on an online tree regarding the Cherokees, because it is grossly inaccurate. And I quote, The Cherokee never lived in Virginia, or had anything to do with the Powhatan tribe that did live in Virginia. End quote. Let that sink in a moment. Reading directly from the encyclopedia now, quote, In an effort to resolve concerns of settlers and land speculators following the western boundary established by the Royal Proclamation of 1763 by King George III, it was desired to move the boundary further west to encompass more settlers who were outside the boundary. The two treaties that resulted to address this issue were the Treaty of Hard Labor and the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. 
On October 17, 1768, British Representative John Stewart signed the Treaty of Hard Labor with the Cherokee Tribe, relinquishing all Cherokee claims to the property west of the Allegheny Mountains and east of the Ohio River, comprising all of present-day West Virginia, except the extreme southwestern part of the state. End quote. Take a look at the history of West Virginia. It was originally part of the British Virginia colony between 1607 and 1776. Then it was the western part of the state of Virginia from 1776 to 1863. And so it wasn't until 1863 that West Virginia became a new state. So after the Treaty of Hard Labor in 1768, now came the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. This treaty was signed by the Iroquois, to which now changed the border outlined in the previous treaty and moved the Cherokee boundaries further west. So on October 18, 1770, down in South Carolina, yet another treaty, the Treaty of Lacabar, was signed between John Stewart, once more, and the Cherokees to fix the boundary for the western limit of the frontier settlements of Virginia and North Carolina. Now that's three separate treaties that serve as source placing the Cherokees in Virginia and detailing not just how they began to be pushed out of their native land, but when. Now take a step back. Look at the names being used here. John Stewart, Treaty of Lockabar. 1,000 Cherokees were hosted by Alexander Cameron at Lockabar Plantation to discuss the Treaty of Negotiations. These are Scottish names. These are Scottish men. Now look back to William Thomas, the adopted son of Yona Jessica. By the end of his lifetime, he had served as the principal chief of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. He was an elected state senator in North Carolina. He served as a colonel in the Confederate States Army during the Civil War when he led Thomas's Legion of Cherokee Indians and Highlanders. They were active from 1862 to 1865. Let's repeat that. Thomas's Legion of Cherokee Indians and Highlanders. Now there's a unique combination. Scottish Lord Proprietor and the first proprietary governor of North Carolina, William Drummond, came to North Carolina in 1683. This specific year in Scotland is wildly active with Covenanters rising against their government. From the 1680s through the killing times in Scotland into the 1690s and beyond were a mass deportation of Scottish men. They fought against religious persecution and were forcibly removed from their homeland when they were overpowered. Very similar to the plight of the Cherokee. The Scottish Highlanders fought for their freedom and ways of life through the century until the rising of 45 saw them fall. With the fall of the Scottish Highlanders in 1745 at Culloden, yet another wave of immigrants came to the colonies. It's not a far cry to see what they had in common with the Cherokee. So we have Scottish immigrants colonizing in the Cherokee areas in 1683. Let's revisit Chief Donahue, reportedly born circa 1700. Chief Donahue, Scottish clan and surname Donashad, which has many Donahue surname spellings and pronunciation variants. There's certainly a connection. We find that Clan Donachad is also known as Clan Robertson. In fact, Clan legend says that one of their first recognized chiefs, Stout Donkin, fought with Robert the Bruce supporting him. And in 1314, at the Battle of Bannockburn, 
where stout Duncan fought and died for his king, that his clan was from then on known as Clan Robertson, named for the king. Patriotic and loyal, the clan was again fighting for their rights with the Jacobite Rising of 1689. Many of the clan were taken prisoner after the Jacobites were defeated at the Battle of Dunkeld in the same year. Many of the prisoners were executed or banished to the colonies. Now for the second part of that erroneous statement, that the Cherokee had nothing to do with the Powhatan tribes of Virginia. Let's quote that encyclopedia again. Quote, The first Anglo-Cherokee contact may have been in 1656, when English settlers of the Virginia colony recorded that six to seven hundred Indians had encamped at Bloody Run, now on the eastern edge of Richmond, Virginia. They were driven off by a combined force of English and tributary Pamunkey. So here, despite some debate by scholars on the tribes of the Iroquois that encamped, we have a direct clash of Cherokee and or their allied tribes and a tribe of the Powhatan Confederacy. Later, in 1683, Iroquoian-speaking Indians attacked Virginian Indian settlements. If you're still questioning if there was contact between these tribes, look no further than William Thomas, adopted son of Unalaska. William's biological parents were Richard Thomas and Temperance Calvert. William's father drowned before he was born in 1805. But pay close attention to his mother's maiden surname, Calvert. She was a relation to the proprietary Calvert family in Maryland nearly two centuries prior. Perhaps you've watched another video I've made regarding Giles Brent. If you haven't, you should take a moment and do so to get caught up. Giles Brent was the Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. His wife was Mary Kittimaquand, daughter of Big Beaver, whose Christian name was Charles, a chief of the Piscataway Nation, which is a part of the Powhatan Confederacy. Giles' sister, Anne Brent, was married to Leonard Calvert, the first proprietary governor of Maryland. There is a very strong possibility that William and Giles are related bringing not just a familial connection from William to the Piscataway, but also to the Calverts that dealt with the tribes of the Powhatan Confederacy. And here he is, the adopted son of a Cherokee leader and eventually the principal chief of the Eastern Cherokee. So now that we've talked this out with reason and fact, I'd like to present a theoretical version of a family tree. Perhaps we have a Cherokee chief, active in the 1650s through 1680s. And this chief has a daughter of marrying age circa 1680s to 1690s. Perhaps a Scottish Highlander of Clan Robertson, bearing the surname Donahue, arrived in the area having been banished from Scotland. This Highlander meets and marries the daughter of a Cherokee chief and perhaps is absorbed into the tribe, as was a common theme among the Cherokee. They produced a son that takes his Scottish father's name, Donahue. And perhaps this Donahue has some high-ranking position in the tribe due to his mother. It is not uncommon for daughters of the tribal chiefs to be married to white men in this time period for the sake of peace. Then he goes on to marry a white woman named Mary Wentworth, and they produce a daughter named Elizabeth Betty Donahue. Elizabeth Donahue would thus be of the Cherokee tribe. Remember, the tribes used oral tradition over written history, so it's entirely possible his name and status among the tribe were never recorded. We then have Elizabeth Donahue producing children, those children would in turn become members of their mother's Cherokee tribe. Yonaluska, her son, eventually rising to the rank of leader, though never assuming the title chief. And thus, 
his white adopted son eventually becoming principal chief of the Eastern Band of Cherokees. But again, this is my theory and not fact. And theories are meant to be tested and proven or disproven. As proposed in my Kokum video, I'd like to present the idea of a DNA study of the Native American tribes of the Virginias. Definitely view that video for a more in-depth glimpse at the capabilities of a DNA study. There will be many more videos on this subject, so keep an eye out or contact me directly at ancestralspotlight at gmail.com. So whether you have Chief Donahue or a legend of some chief don't know who in your family tree, please reach out for details of the upcoming DNA study. While I'll initially focus on the tribes of the Virginias, I'd be happy to host separate DNA studies for any tribe, or peoples for that matter. On the topic of Chief Donahue, in my opinion, the details are too intricate to have been connected at that time, the 1830s through the 1860s. The mass information we have at our fingertips today simply wasn't available. The timeline of global events is too streamlined to be coincidence. 